I think the focus needs to be on London and the UK being its own champion and, and being its own story. I think it's always, uh, there's always an opportunity to look at others and say, we could be like them, we could do it like this. But I think we need to create the UK way. And I think there's always stuff to do in a role like this. There's always stuff you want to do. I mean, yeah. the list never ends. And that's the exciting bit. You're passionate about it. You, you want the best for your customers. You, you want to achieve um, great things. But you also have to balance important things in your life, like your kids and your family and friends. There's so many great stories of the fintech businesses, your Monzos and your Starlings 10 years ago. People probably thought, oh, they'll never get there. They're reaching levels of scale where they are competing. Mm. You've got companies like Wise. You, there's many a, a great success story in the UK. So I think we just have to keep focusing on the positives. And if you keep doing that, you really do create a, a successful operating environment. Welcome to Boardroom Uncovered, powered by City AM. I'm John Robinson, City AM's UK editor, and today my guest is the president of Robin Hood UK, Jordan Sinclair. The South African took up his role with the US trading platform when it launched in the UK earlier this year, in the aftermath of various high-profile cases, including the GameStop saga. The UK launch has been billed as an attempt to help clean up Robin Hood's reputation, but many have questioned whether its model is suitable for this market. So. Why should the UK public trust Robin Hood with their savings? And will the company be successful in creating a sustainable business in this country? Without any further delay, let's dive in. Jordan, thank you very much for, for coming on Boarding Run Cover today. Um, really appreciate you coming. Thank you for having me. Um, always like to start with a big question, one that we can really get our, our teeth into. Uh, so, Jordan Sinclair, president of Robin Hood UK, what's your favourite Robin Hood film? Ooh, I'd have to say the animated version, actually. Oh, really? Yeah, of all of them, I think just the representation of the characters as a big bear or a, or a fox is actually my best representation of it. Uh, my team joked that I, I should try and claim Kevin Costner, but my wife disagreed with that one. So I think I'm going to go with the animated version. Surely that's the best one, surely, Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. It's got to be. I'm going to stick with the animated version. <laughs> Controversial in my view, but fair enough. What's, uh, what character do you think you would be in, in the Robin Hood mythology? Sure, I'm going to have to actually take this one. I've forgotten his name, the big bear. Um, little John. Little John, there we go. Yeah, <laughs> so can we take that one again? That's it. What is it about Little John that you think uh, personifies you? I think actually that representation of that big bear, uh, you know, I think that friendly kind of authentic disposition, but also what the big bear could be quite, I don't know, have a bit of force, but being able to just manage that and just be a friend and, and someone that supports along the way. I don't know. I think that big bear was a good representation of little John. Do you think that sums you up then? Somebody who's is obviously, you know, uh, very welcoming and approachable, but then also you've got the steely side to get to the position that you've got to. I think authenticity and is an important part of being a leader and that form of inspiration can come through many different ways. I think it's how you treat people, it's how you create that team environment. I think your ambition, your competitiveness to kind of be better for your customers, do better, to set targets that are ambitious. And, and I think for us in particular, it's a large market opportunity and just relentlessly go after that. So I think that there's many ways you can inspire a team, but I think also being an authentic team member as well as leader is a great way to bring them on that journey with you, especially when you're building something from scratch. And also when you get to those milestones and the team feels like they've actually contributed and they celebrated knowing that they've got us there as well as, as me helping them get there. It's all one theory, isn't it? Trying to motivate people that you can read as many management books as possible and be inspired by people who've, who've above you. But there's always going to be members of the team that are more difficult to inspire than others. What do you do in that situation? I think for us, what we're trying to achieve is really helping customers get access to investing and growing wealth over the longer term. And often the best place to start is actually grounded in what the customer needs and customer research. What I find a good way is actually to make sure that the team members attend the customer research sessions and in person, being part of it. It's amazing how sometimes for team members that one snippet or that one customer who's maybe a bit frustrated actually or mm. on the other side actually loved what they're doing can just resonate and be that anchor point on almost a tiebreaker sometimes on, on decisions to say, well, let's go back to the research. Let's see what the customers have told us. And that really helps, I think, just remind some of the team members of what we're building 
why you have to have a long-term view and why it's sometimes hard actually to disrupt an industry. It isn't an easy journey, but if you keep at it and have that long-term view, you get there. You mentioned the word ambition as well. Mm. Would you describe yourself as an ambitious person? Yes, I think so. I think I've always felt that I've had the, the experience and a kind of foundational setup from an education and a life experience to go far in life. And I've been given that opportunity, which is fantastic. I think you just have to work hard and create those opportunities for yourself. I think in this sector in particular, Robin Hood was always the pioneer that looked at this large market opportunity, looked at what customers weren't getting in terms of a fair shot in the US 10 years ago. The market looked pretty much like the UK market does today. High account minimums, high fees, your large incumbents dominating a market, and the average person just not able to access investing and take, take part in growing their wealth just to achieve their goals, be it retirement or or buying a house, or just as a kind of portion of their portfolio. Fast forward 10 years, and, and what Robinhood achieved was that the whole market moved to a commission-free model. Account minimums became the standard. Fast forward, and, and we achieved actually taking market share from these large incumbents and capturing large account sizes, almost 130 billion in assets, over 24 million customers, a listed business. And having that ambition in order to just relentlessly go after that when I'm sure many 10 years ago said, oh, you guys are just a small fintech or mm. you'll never get there. And looking at the UK market, I have the same vision for Robinhood. We've started and we've launched our first market outside of the US, which is very exciting. And it's a great milestone, but it's just a milestone. It's a start. And what we have to do is just build the product in a way that continues to innovate, continues to localize for UK customers. And in 10 years' time, perhaps we, we're exactly in the same position where the market looks very different and customers are getting a, a fairer deal. Well, we'll get on to Robin Hood and how it's growing in the UK after launching earlier this year. But I want to take you back to South Africa. <laughs> uh, tell me about your childhood there and, um, and growing up. Did you always want to move abroad to work? Is that always the plan? I, I loved South Africa. I still do love South Africa. Uh, I had a, a great childhood. Uh, I, fantastically fortunate to have amazing schooling and, and education opportunities. Thank you to my, to my parents for that. I think home is always going to be South Africa for me. I've, I've lived abroad for almost 12 years, but it's, it's still home. My wife's South African. Our, our kids are, are born here, but I, we still kind of think of them as South African kids too. So. Springbok jerseys for Christmas. That's I, I had two little girls. So they did get Springbok jerseys. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so they'll, they'll be Springbok supporters. I'm sure they'll want to watch England too, so we'll have to figure out. We had uh, twins, so maybe one in each. We'll, yeah, maybe a yeah, we'll split see. the difference. And I think for us in, in South Africa, we always kind of look up at the world and being far down south and say, well, there is this big world out there. Let, let's go experience it. Let's take our skills and, and have knowledge from home and, mm. and see how we fare abroad. And I think that global opportunity versus just the national opportunity is always intriguing for us. I think also the way we're brought up at home is, is very entrepreneurial and very just get it done. We don't have a benefit system or a, a safety net of perhaps what more developed countries do have. It very much is just find a way, get it done. I think that kind of humble approach to, to teaming and leading and achieving is, is very South African in us. It's, and you see it in some of our sports teams. You're not celebrated for kind of doing your job, but you're there to help everyone achieve it. And when you do, it, it very much is we achieved it together. And, and that's the beauty of it. Mm. I think that's always something that at home we, we know we can take somewhere else and just really give it a go. And I, I think that's, that's just part of us. So do you always think that you were going to have to move out away from South Africa to progress your career in, in the way that you wanted to? Because you obviously say that you are ambitious, but did you always think that there was a ceiling in South Africa that you then had to move? No, I, I don't think there was a ceiling. I mean, I think the, the opportunities in South Africa are enormous. And mm. I have friends that I studied with together then and gone on to do amazing things and credit to them. And I don't think we ever feel like we have to move. Mm. I think it's just a, a, a feeling that you want to travel and you want to explore the world. And I was very lucky to travel a lot when I was younger. And I think that, that feeling to just be adventurous is in you and you just want to go and see. And mm. Moved across to, um, to the UK, I studied in Edinburgh for a year. I spent time in South Korea and I taught English there for a little while and traveled. I then spent some time in Oslo um, and then moved back to the UK. So I kind of did a bit of a, a round trip and I think all those cumulative experiences 
really do fair, uh, set you up well mm. when you actually move to the UK. And so actually, I'm, I'm going to make this home and give it a shot. Moving to the UK, obviously coming from South Africa and um, being in, in Norway for a bit, what was your perception of the city of London? I mean, it was really exciting for me. I, I joined Monitor Deloitte at the time and their financial services strategy team, and we we're working with the largest banks and asset managers at the time and really exposed to all the things that I, I'd been reading about from South Africa or we had kind of seen businesses that something to aspire to work with or or with or, or at at some point in time. So for me, that was the great opportunity. I think businesses at scale, and I went on to work with Barclays for a long time, and I think that's a great lesson for me is at scale, how do these business operate? How do you think about your costs and your customers and building your capital structure and almost an organizational structure at fast, significant scale to perhaps where we are today? but thinking about that already for when you get there. Mm. There seems to be over the last few years, probably since the Brexit referendum, that people within the city of London, there's been this anxiety about its place in the world, you know, and mm. being overtaken by, by different markets. As sort of an outsider, but you've been here for a few years now, what do you think, do you think the reputation of the city of London is justified, or do you think we've got maybe slightly inflated egos? <laughs> No, I think it is justified. And I think Brexit or no Brexit relative to the rest of Europe and in terms of the stock exchange, in terms of the businesses and success stories, I think London continues to punch above its weight. I think the focus needs to be on London and the UK being its own champion and, and being its own story. I think it's always uh, there's always an opportunity to look at others and say we could be like them, we could do it like this. But I think we need to create the UK way. And I think a lot of the initiatives that are underway and there's champions out there people like Mark Austin and Julia Hoggett and who are out there telling this positive story about the UK and there's a lot of capital markets related initiatives and you add them all up mm. and I think you do continue to punch above your weights and I think there's so many great stories of the fintech businesses, your Monzos and your Starlings 10 years ago, people probably thought, oh, they'll never get there. They're reaching levels of scale where they are competing. Mm. And you've got companies like Wise, you, there's many a, a great success story in the UK so I think we just have to keep focusing on the positives. And if you keep doing that, you really do create uh, a successful operating environment. Do you think Britain is good at championing its success stories, though? And, <laughs> you know, lots of people say that the UK is not really open for business, not really welcoming. There's lots of American companies, you know, like Robin Hood mm. coming over and thinking twice about setting up in the UK because we tend to dump things down and we sort of, you know, pile on companies and overly negative. That seems to be the perception lots of people have. Well, for us, it was a great place to expand. It's our, our first brokerage market outside of the US and it has been what we expected it to be. I mean, it's a, it's a great place for talent. It's, as I said, some fantastic businesses that have, have grown in the UK. So I think it's no surprise that it's a great place for talent. It's a strong regulatory environment. It's uh, a great place from a market opportunity size perspective. The, Retail investment space continues to grow. The UK is underinvested relative to both OECD countries and the US. So for us, it's, it's a great place to start and to expand to. So I, I think that all the ingredients are there. What makes Robin Hood different, though? If I'm a UK investor, never been invested before, and I'm having a look at the different companies that are available in the UK to investors. What makes Robinhood stand out? Why should I trust you with my savings? Yeah, and trust is a, is a great thing that customers are interested in, right? I think what's important is that their life savings are with the platform that will be around for the horizon of their life savings. I think having that scale in the US, being a listed business, demonstrating that maturity of a, of a 10-year-old platform that we can bring over here certainly does give customers that feeling that they can trust us. And Trust is not something that ever stops. You have to earn that every single day with your customers, through your customer service, through the way you delight them, through your user interface, and just giving them great service. But when we spoke to UK customers, we really wanted to understand what needs weren't being met, because there are other platforms out there. But you gave that example of you wanted to start Invest. There's generally more traditional platforms that are gonna charge you 11 pounds 95 per trade, they're going to then charge you another 1% on your trade to access your Apple, Amazon, NVIDIA. But perhaps you only wanted to invest £100. That's quite a large barrier to just get started investing. So what we've done is we've removed commissions. We've also removed FX fees on US trades. 
but we also offer customers 5% interest on uninvested cash. Because what we found is that a lot of their deposits weren't necessarily earning the, the interest that was reflective of the current high rates environment. But also if you haven't quite reached that decision to make an investment or you're still on that investment journey to get confidence or kind of make that first choice, that your money is still working hard for you. And it's never too early to start investing, I suppose. I read somewhere the other day that you talked to your young twins about <laughs> investing. Is that yes. correct? That is correct. That, one of the, not one of the first things, but we opened a junior ISA for them uh, pretty soon after they were born. Uh, their Christmas present in their first year was a, a contribution to their junior ISA. I'm sure they were delighted. <laughs> they were thrilled. Um, so uh, for us, that, that's an important part of uh, it's how my wife grew up too, um, from, from her dad, uh, birthday and Christmas presents, and it's the same for actually their other grandchildren. Just uh, contributions to their, to their savings and in an investment so that can grow over time. And it's amazing, I look at their, um, my wife's niece and nephew and how their portfolios have grown over time and they don't quite realise it yet, but they will reach the age where actually that's built up quite a pot that, that can be theirs, that, that can help them achieve some of their goals in future. And I think that's, that's probably a better option than buying another pair of shoes or uh, another toy. And I think it's that, that culture of thinking about what is the next best place for me to put this excess pound or, or dollar and thinking about the future and making those choices. I think in the UK in particular, there is a real worry about how much customers and, and individuals have saved for pensions and retirement. I think the ways people were living their lives now and how much they've saved for when they are retired, it's very difficult to see that they have put enough aside. I think there's, it's talking about that. I think that's an important part in the UK culture. We can really kind of encourage, talk about investing in, in all spheres of life, being at, at home with your kids and their junior ISA. I think what uh, you they guys... They have toys, right? They have toys. Okay, good. <laughs> they have toys, yeah. Bloomberg toys. Okay. <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> but I, I do think it, it really does start then. Um, I think of my own journey in, in investing and reading about it and learning about it and, and making my first investment. It shouldn't be such a, a thing that you don't feel like you have access to or that you can't get started. And I think the UK as a percentage of household wealth invested in equities is just 11%, which is significantly off uh, Europe and the US, which is up in the upper 30s. Why do you think that is? Some of it is cultural. I, the, the UK customer generally prefers to invest in, in cash deposits. Unfortunately, in the high inflationary environment, that generally means they actually aren't getting a, a good return over time. I think it's just knowing that you have more options besides just putting it in cash. And mm. I think that's a bit of an education piece as well, financial literacy. I think that there really is a, a lot of room for improvement there. And the UK doesn't need to get to, to the upper 30s. I mean, the US, they talk about their 401ks from an early age. They talk about investing with their friends. They reading about the big US stock listed companies all the time. So I think it's a bit more natural there, mm -hmm. but here there's definitely room, room to grow. Let's go back to that topic of trust, because it mm. is so important. You know, you're asking people, who's a company, any company, are asking people to, to trust them with their life savings. Yep. You know, however diversified that portfolio is, it's still going into your company, being handled by your company or others. But you know, it doesn't take long on Google to find lots of sagas connected with Robin Hood in previous mm. years. I appreciate it's before you joined the company, but you'll be well aware. Probably the, the famous one over here is GameStop. Mm. That must have an impact on Robin Hood's reputation. And you've launched in this market this year. But have you come up against people wanting to ask questions about that, concerned about getting involved in Robin Hood because of mm. what's happened in the past with GameStop and other um, incidents as well? Yeah, I think when you look at that the GameStop kind of uh, event that happened and you take the, the stock name aside, I think what we did recognize is what we set out to achieve to give retail customers access to investing was achieved. And fast forward from then till now, we actually see almost 80% of our US customers that held the GameStop position then have matured with us and still are investing with us, but they've matured into our retirement product. They hold a cash savings product mm. with us. They're a, a gold subscription uh, holder with us. And they really have come on that journey where a position like GameStop, maybe where they started investing, and there's definitely pros and cons of that being your entry point. 
but they've been with us on that journey. And then what we see now is that there are customers that are interested in the volatility of a, of a stock like that, but it's a portion of their portfolio. It's not necessarily a whole portfolio. I think you just have to show that, that growth and maturity. And for us as a platform, offering things like our retirement accounts in the US really does show how we have matured as a business. It's not every business that has a Netflix documentary and then a feature <laughs> film about it as well. It, it was a huge event, a global news story. That must have a long-term impact in terms of the number of people that would consider looking at, at Robinhood, even in the UK that you've only just launched in. Yeah, we, of course, as you said, building trust takes time, and I think that's an important part of us of telling our Robin Hood story here in the UK. I mean, that's just a movie, and again, as I say, demonstrated access to, to being able to invest. But for us, it's just demonstrating with customers how we do build trust with them, how we offer them support, how if they need to speak to someone, they can actually pick up the phone and talk to a real human with Robin Hood UK. And I think those type of differentiating factors really do help customers because it is their life savings. So we have 24 seven chat, we have a phone line where you can speak to, to agents as well. I think all of those things really do help to kind of build that trust with customers. Mm. And in the US, you have something like 23 million customers? Almost 24 million customers. 20, almost 24 million. Yeah. Um, has it been since you launched in the UK, how many customers have you got at the moment? So we're in a blackout period at the moment as a listed company, so I, I can't share any particular numbers, but we really have been happy with the growth as, a, as our first market outside of the US. We know from customers that there's still work to do and, and things to add. But for us, it's a great milestone as our first market. And we just have to continue to innovate. And we offer 24-5 trading to customers. What that does is just removes things like traditional time zones, which for the UK customers is quite funny, right? If you want to invest in the US stock market, you need to wait until the afternoon, set your alarm for, for 2.30. You're probably busy at the office, nine o'clock at night to market closed. Mm. Earnings calls happen after hours. You're probably a bit like me and sometimes do stay up and listen to earnings calls. Uh, but the market moves, right? Yeah. And on other platforms, customers now need to wait till the next day. The market will have moved during the evening. Other events may have happened and completely have missed out on the opportunity if they did want to invest. So for us about entering the UK, it's through innovation and doing things differently like that. And now the challenge is to continue to localize and, and give customers local products, things like an ISA tax wrapper, mm. which is a fantastic savings and investment vehicle. Mm. And that's kind of the next step for us on the journey. Do you think that Robinhood has, over the last few years has grown up? You know, the confetti cannon, for example, is, is history. Um, do you think the company has matured like the customers? I do think there's a level of maturity of us as a business. I mean, we, we were a startup and a fintech at, at some point in time. And... Now we're a listed business with almost 130 billion in assets. And I think some of the people we've brought on in our, in our senior team, people like Dan Gallagher, who's a SEC commissioner, I mean, JB McKenzie, who's come on and run our futures business and our overall international business. Steve Quirk, he's our chief brokerage officer. I think all these people kind of demonstrate that maturity as well as the business and that product set where we aren't just the equities platform for customers we offer them a high yield savings product mm. they want to park their cash we've just started a credit card in the u.s as well we have i think that's that maturity as well is not just offering one product for a customer but slowly providing them all their financial kind of services in one place okay and we talked about your ambition but what's mm. the ambition of robin hood uk where do you want to be in in five years time you said that you're here for the long term yeah what's the plan I think it's twofold, and I think they do run in parallel. I mean, building a long-term profitable business is, is absolutely our goal for Robinhood UK. We've demonstrated that in the US. We've had uh, two profitable quarters, and we continue to demonstrate diversified revenue streams. So building that business here in the UK absolutely is our goal. But what runs in parallel is non-commercial. I think that's education and, and really giving customers and, and non-customers the tools and the information and the educational materials to really just grow and, and become more familiar with financial terms, feel more confident in investing, and making sure that your materials are available on your website to anyone. In our app, we've seen the vast majority of our customers engage with the research and investment tool and our learning modules. All of that is really important to us. And I, it, those goals run in, in parallel. And financial literacy and financial education in the UK has a long way to go. And if we can move that needle even a little bit, for me, that, that is success as well. Sometimes that's just plain language. 
isn't it? And just uh, providing a glossary of terms instead of assuming that prior knowledge. That's it. It's talking to the customer in a way that the customer understands, right? And I think, and testing that with customers and say, hey, we're going to explain it this way. Does that actually make sense to you? And I think it is that journey with customers and becoming that voice for them where they want to read more about the stock market and actually where they come is our website and or our, in our app and actually can learn. I think the other piece is connecting news and what's happening in the markets to, to actually individual stocks as well. We heard from UK customers that actually access to news is something they, they really are struggling to make that connection. They had one app for news or they wanted to read news somewhere and it was paywalled or it was too complicated. They had another website they went for charting. They used one app for this, another app for that. I think I have seven. And the customers we talk to all in the same environment, seven different things. Yeah. And that's crazy, right? So for us, if you can make it digestible, make it understandable, and you can have it all in one place, I do think that helps the customer. I'm always interested to know how somebody in your position got there. How do you, did you get approached <laughs> for this job? Did you answer a job advert? Like, how does that process work? It's actually quite a unique story. So in my previous employer, I launched their first market outside of the UK. And I've always followed Robin Hood from an earnings perspective. I've always been an admirer of the business uh, from 10 years ago. Even my time at Barclays, we used to follow what Robin Hood was doing. I mean, they really were the pioneer in the market. Vlad went out to the market in our Q4 results at the beginning of 2023 and announced the ambition that they would be live in the UK by the end of the year. And they were expanding internationally. And they'd appointed um, JB McKenzie, who's leading our international and futures business. And... I reached out to, to JB and we started chatting and said, I think let's, let's hear more about what the journey is. And we spent some time together and eventually it resulted in this opportunity, which is a great opportunity. And uh, yeah, looking forward to working for many more years together with them. And how many interviews was it? Was it some of the UK, some of the US? Did you have to fly over? The team was over here as well. So I spent some time in person. So it was great. I mean, I think that's always important is, yeah. is getting to know who you work with. The UK office, we work with the US teams a lot. We work cross-functionally. I think being part of the wider group is, is a fantastic opportunity. And, and I think that's important when you do start something new. Speak to them, understand kind of the way they work, who they are at work, outside work. And actually, a funny story, when I was chatting to JB on, the, on a couple calls later, he says, oh, what's on your mind? And my wife and I had actually just found out we were having twins. And I, th I think we told my, my folks and maybe a few friends, not many. We were still getting over the fact that we were having twins. And I mean, we were very grateful. But we kind of hoped for one and we got two, which is very lucky. And we were just processing this. And anyway, so I said to JB, I mean, yeah, we, we're having twins. And yeah, we're just thinking about what that means. He said, oh, I've got twins. So he's like, yeah, you'll be fine. <laughs> And uh, the next time he came over, he said, oh, uh, Brit, my wife said, uh, come Brit and bring uh, Brit for dinner and let's chat about twin life. And I think it's just so nice. And the next time his wife and actually his kids came over, I spent some time with them too. And all of that just makes such a difference. I think uh, there's hard work and there's always things to do and you always want to achieve more. But knowing that you have that kind of understanding and there is always things outside of work, right? I think everyone's balancing that and they're equally important and finding that balance and knowing what's important to an individual, I think that's, that's really great. How do you find that balance then? <laughs> it must be a full-on job, but then obviously you've got a full-on home life as well. I think it's even harder for my wife, to be honest. I think mm. she's got the harder job than me. Um, so I'm the lucky one in this. But I, I, you find a way, right? Uh, in the mornings, I'm, I'm up with the girls. We, we head out every morning. We've got our favorite coffee place. Uh, some days we run, some days we walk. <laughs> and I think that's always a great way to spend time with them. Just start the day, no matter what time it is. Some mornings they're, they're up earlier than they should be. Um, some ice or chat on the way to the coffee shop. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can check their portfolios. Yeah, just see yeah. how they, they think about their, their asset <laughs> allocation over there. And they can raise an eyebrow if it's not doing as well as they thought it was. Um, They'll be telling you which trades to make in a few years' time. I'm, I'm looking sure. forward to it. I think that's my wife always says to me, she's, that's your department. <laughs> she's then I don't have to listen to your long stories. But I think finding that balance is important. Mm. Uh, there's always stuff to do in a role like this. There's always stuff you want to do. I mean, mm. the list never ends. And that's the exciting bit. You're passionate about it. You, you want the best for your customers. You, you want to achieve um, great things. But you also have to balance important things in your life, like your kids and your family and friends and we're very lucky that we have a great support system and very fortunate with the girls. And that means when you do have time with them, you really just have to be present. And 
I think on the weekends as well, help out, be there, do what you can. And when you're there, I think that's important. Just, just you don't want to miss it. And uh, there always is a way. I always say there's, there's more than enough hours in a day. That's just how you use them. Fantastic. Well, what a perfect way to end. Jordan, thank you very, thank much, very much for coming on Boardroom Uncovered. Thank you for having Cheers. me. Cheers.